For many years, youth culture creation has been the forerunner in Western civilization engineering. The younger generation of any given time represents the influential group of the future. Therefore, these generations of youth, in order to ensure civilization follows the intended direction, must be and always have been conditioned and inculcated via culture, mainly pop culture, education, media birthed fanfare, and food for identity. The idea of finding oneself, for example, is many times accomplished through pop culture, media and establishment generated culture, a concept we call culture creation administered by examples like the entertainment industry via secret intelligence with its roots and foundation in weaponized anthropology brought to us by examples like margaret mead and gregory bateson with its roots in further back ideologues like wilhelm reich uh, charles darwin and social darwinism to gnosticism and alchemy and well you can see the development of it all over time from Nimrod to Simon Magus, John D, Sabati Zevi, Darwin, Crowley, Freud, Bernays, Huxley, Kinsey, to modern wizards like Moonviz or uh, Robert W. Pittman. We'll get to Pittman in a moment, but from Gnostic alchemy and Kabbalah to secular humanism and behaviorist scientism to, well, modern cable television. All these ideas and doctrines consolidated into a culture that fits perfectly into a little box for humans to sit in front of and learn from for hours a day. Youth culture creation via the television and mass media got its official start in the 50s, of course following its predecessor, the radio. The technology of using radio waves to carry information or sound modulated properties of electromagnetic energy through space, or as occultist Thomas Edison coined it, etheric force. Radio, as most if not all forms of technology, was first perfected within the military for alleged communication during World War I. Though it appears, and more importantly, radio was to be developed into a home appliance a new opportunity to tap millions at once. The first social program of the state. Radio broadcasting, casting spells and creating culture, shaping perspective, or forming reality in all living rooms across the nation. Similar to how the television would follow suit, and then the personal computer, and now the handheld mobile smartphone. One of the first uses of radio was social engineering from the beginning. With Franklin D. Roosevelt, radio was used to sell FDR's new socialist regime called the New Deal of the 30s. At once, millions were reached with one message, mass acceptance and a joyous reception via the newness of American technology. In the relaxed state of comfort in one's own home, huddled up with family members, enthralled by the voice peering from a box. The New Deal was a welfare state prelude program that was sold to America single-handedly by the radio broadcasting system. A great source for a look at radio propaganda of this time is the, uh, the book Psychology of Radio by Cantrell and Alport. Cantrell quotes, by its very nature, radio was a powerful agent of democracy because it penetrated all levels of social, political, and economic barriers. Radio has the potential to be the biggest factor in shaping social solidarity. Well, today we would call this social engineering or state-designed mind control. And this is exactly what it was from the beginning. But, of course, and as always, it is disguised in the veil of entertainment. For example, the black community targeting show Amos and Andy was utilized specifically to run systematic FDR New Deal propaganda spots throughout each airing. And we all understand this was a blackface type of show for the black community, yet they were actually white men playing the roles. 
playing the characters. Uh, this ensured black support and offered the uh, population a false sense of security, identity, and importance. Now, early on in the 20s, under uh, National Broadcasting Corporation, or NBC, and of course, uh, Columbia Broadcasting System, or CBS, uh, programmers and government bodies began to realize that radio had the power to control the actions of man and would gain the trust of the audience that was listening. Immediately, radio programming utilized Bernaysian techniques and aired agents of influence as alleged experts to influence the audience by appealing to authority. Here, radio personalities were created and became not only agents of influence, but trusted sources of information that millions would grow to depend on for their perception of what is happening in the world around them. Dialogue could save the world, said Lewis Hill in 1942, ACLU member and leftist propaganda artist, also founder of the uh, pioneering progressive radio station KPFA in Pacifica, California. In 1951, KPFA receives the first major grant for the support of a non-commercial broadcast operation by, of course, the Ford Foundation. KPFA would go on to be a widely respected and trusted so-called independent radio source, yet from its start, it has been a controlled opposition propaganda outlet funded by major establishment foundations, mainly Ford and Carnegie as well. Why KPFA? Why Pacifica? Well, this was the early 1950s, less than 20 miles from San Francisco. And what better way to prime a mass group for a new left counterculture movement that is only a decade away? Radio broadcasting. Who do you think sold the world the Grateful Dead, the hippie and new age movements, the anti-war socialist brigades, uh, the degenerate beat generation, free love and secular humanism? None other than KPFA. Well, let's just say they were at the front lines of these movements. The counterculture and the new left had a permanent home at KPFA, and still do. A Herculean bullhorn to shout their rhetoric and mantras to the masses. And yes, Ford Foundation, with the assistance of the OSS, CIA, would go on to fund other social operations like PBS. Public Broadcasting Service, um, the Rand Corporation, the Aspen Institute, and as well, Bilderberg. Ford also funded Margaret Mead's work in the development of Tavistock Institute. We will show why these two projects are so important later, but for now, we will focus on the radio. Oh, and let us not forget the beloved and alleged independent radio station NPR, National Public Radio. Yeah. Ford funded as well. Radio would be used to not only shape public perspective, identity, and uh, political theory, but to create mass gatherings and revolutionary protest, similar to how its offspring, the internet, namely uh, social media, is producing the same things today and being used for the same ends and agendas. Then just like the internet today, Radio transformed a generation, practically overnight. From audio waves to mass public action. But how did they know how to do this? They used music, certain bands and their attitudes, uh, movies and advertisements, uh, the cult of personality, and the manipulation of sound waves to literally transform society. How did they know how to use radio to accomplish all of this? Well, aside from the Kabbalist, occult, or spiritual aspects of radio that we find in Thomas Edison, we find the scientific answer for this in 1939 at the Princeton University under the auspices of figures like Hadley Cantrell, uh, Paul Lazarfeld, and uh, John Marshall.
and of course, Frankfurt School elite and OSS agent himself, Theodore Adorno, the Princeton Research Radio Project, set the stage for sound and media social engineering. The Princeton Research Radio Project studied the social psychological effects of messages in radio and its mass programming capabilities, or potential, especially the 1938 War of the Worlds Halloween airing, where Orson Welles aired a uh, false flag type of story over the radio, uh, sold as being real, but in fact it, it was a fake story. This, this would be a, a very early example of your first fake news. And it was done on purpose and studied at Princeton to see how a crowd reacts to um, dangerous or alarming information. Though the Princeton Radio Project had hundreds of uh, sub-projects, it presented the foundation for all similar studies to follow, like the monumental Macy's conferences of the 50s, for example, where cybernetics was started, and especially all the MK Ultra projects. Princeton stood as a key starting point. Adorno and scientists wanted to know how human behavior correlates with music the audio control of human emotions to find effective crowd control techniques, audio that would or could induce mass hysteria, and overall the creation of manageable subcultures via music and sound, melodic and rhythmic organization. Establishing radio and television as a meta-analysis of mass subjectivity the Princeton Radio Project also studied the dynamics of music, sound, and light, and the electronic development of bioenergetic psychoacoustics, coined by Jack Lacan. These studies would later bring us light shows and sound shows we saw in the psychedelic era, in raves and uh, music festivals, and in clubs and casinos. The radio to television, uh, the psychedelic to discotheques and rave electronica, decade to decade. All these eras find their psychobiological and technological foundations in the Rockefeller family funded Princeton Research Radio Project of 1939. And several years after this project, it is no surprise that radio broadcasting services began to encapsulate America like never before much stronger than its infantile days during FDR and the New Deal, and much more effective by now utilizing music and the culture that came with it to shape the society that consumes it. With the 50s in full swing, so was the growth in production and use of the television. At this time, NBC, ABC, and CBS all were transitioning their primetime radio programming to the new medium. And it is here where monumental culture change began to take place. Though television was marked to change culture, it would also create subcultures and cultural dialectics between them. Probably the most vital subculture created during this time was the media creation of the teenager. A new target population and control group to shape, indoctrinate, and sell a new identity this was accomplished nearly single-handedly through Hollywood celebritism, and namely, James Dean, or um, Elvis. It's shocking. I watched him gyrate his legs and swivel his hips. And our parent-teachers group feels he should not be on television. And the new teen film propaganda campaign that was unleashed on the American public via cinema and television, and of course, music. 
and to add to identity, things like blue jeans and the automobile were included to round out the parameters of this new, hip, and rebellious youth, or better, teen culture. Not only could they sell this group products, but moreover they could sell them ideas, a lifestyle, and in result, manufacture identity, and change a generation and the future forever. This new rebellious teen culture would pave the way for the uh, beatniks and hipsters, or the counterculture of the 60s, and the new wave culture clubs of the 80s. During the infancy of television programming, Hollywood celebritism and major media networks in general, the 1950s was an era where science, alchemy, and global government proponents were not only entertaining Americans, they were actually structuring state-of-the-art mind control behind the scenes. Uh, the Macy conferences officially brought physical scientists and behaviorists and psychiatrists together at the same table to study the dynamics between human behavior and machines, and the effects of technology on the humankind. Moreover, what types of technology and which types of techniques would be required to predict, explain, and control the behavior of humans? It is no coincidence that immediately as these conferences ended, music industries, Hollywood productions, and television programming blossomed nationwide. At this time, Stanford Research Institute was building Disneyland in Anaheim. Hugh Hefner was debuting Playboy magazine, and Alan Dulles was beginning the MK Ultra projects. And of course, Frankfurt School's Theodore Adorno just published his authoritarian personality piece, formulated and released on the UC Berkeley campus, which of course spread like wildfire across all universities. National mind control was now at its peak growth period. Media, science, technology, education, all angles were being covered, with Ford, Rockefeller, Carnegie and Mellon foundations fronting the bill while the OSS, CIA, American Jewish Committee, CFR, amongst many other think tanks, put all the pieces in their proper places. But in order for Adorno and Orkenheimer of the Frankfurt School to bring in their new age left, or Margaret Mead and her Wilhelm Reich-inspired license to be a pervert, or free love culture fantasy to become a reality, American culture had to be destabilized Christianity moral codes had to be severely undermined. And by 1950, this was officially kick-started by the media-manufactured teenager subculture. In 1944, the manufacturing began, with always the media-conditioning propaganda of Skull and Bones publication, the Time Life magazine franchise. The hit story on the new rave of American teen girl life took center stage, opening the door for Seventeen magazine that same year. And the new concept of the teeny bopper, youth consumer culture, a rebellious film and music. Serial dating and premarital sex in automobiles. Time, Life magazines, uh, amongst other mainstream publications, have always played major roles in the formation of culture, specifically the directing of culture and engineering of subcultures. Of course, the uh, bebop and swinger scenes catapulted this new teen craze, the uh, hypnotic dance and trends of dress, the identifying music and intimate lyrical content and romantic song concepts. Um, leather jackets and uh, tucked cigarettes and t-shirt sleeves, saddle shoes and bobby socks, poodle skirts and jukeboxes. All these things were not only fresh and exciting, even attractive, but in many ways were commonly forbidden. 
but through the allegiance of radio, television, and music, the state and its trained social engineers were determined to normalize these new and provocative concepts. Now, I know, to us today, these concepts appear rather innocent. Yet it's important to understand they were mere entry-level ideals set to be tweaked and polluted over the decades to come. See, this had to be done in increments, perverted over time, to eventually bring in the new dark age, the postmodern technocult and aeon of Horus, New Babylonia. So to begin this complex process, radio had to be perfected in the Princeton radio projects. Society and its in-group behaviors had to be understood, predictable, manageable, to ultimately structure the post-World War II social hive mind. Once the state earned the trust and control via radio broadcasting of the public, the culture had to then be disjointed and splintered into subgroups, mainly parent versus child. This was accomplished through the creation of the teen, and with the addition of television, Hollywood, and a new booming music industry to radio, the generation gap in American culture war began, posing a formidable threat to its Christian moral fabric and social stability as an independent nation. God is in charge of the universe, then doesn't it logically follow that we are responsible to him? And therefore, isn't it up to us to seek his will for our lives? To find out why we are really here on this earth? To discover how God wants us to use our talents, our abilities, and our energies? With all of the challenges facing us, isn't this the first and the greatest? find ourselves and our destinies in God's plan.